Welcome to the Gray Area Podcast presented by Aura. My name is Kevin Gray. Appreciate you listening and watching today, whether it be on Kevin Gray Sports on YouTube or if you're listening on the podcast, make sure you give the podcast a five-star rating and write a review for it while you're there. And you can like and comment on the video as well. And you can follow me on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. It's interview Wednesdays in the middle of NFL free agency, draft season right around the corner as well. And I figure it was time to give the people – <laughs> what they've been wanting, what they've been looking for. Bring Mizzou and KU together for the good of Cowboys Nation. Joining me on the podcast today, you can find him on Twitter doing his thing. CFO Sports host extraordinaire, Jay Tuck, joining me here on the Gray Area Podcast. Tuck, what's going on? Hey, what's going on, Kev, man? Thanks for having me. See, it's the power of the Dallas Cowboys that can unite Mizzou and <laughs> KU together because can't no other force do that, man. But thanks for having me on, man. It's a long time overdue. For sure, for sure. And been watching you throughout the years and the passion and the energy that you have for Cowboys Nation. And for folks that don't know, before we get into anything in terms of the NFL and the Cowboys themselves, where did this love and joy and passion for not just this business and this form of media and entertainment, but also for football, where did that start for you and how it drives you today and what you and what you do? Yeah, man. So I got to give it credit to my mama, Tuck, man, as I call her. So, you know, every Cowboys game that I'm at, she's by my side. So she's the one who raised me to be a Dallas Cowboys fan since I was a young, you know, Emmett Smith, Michael Irvin, Troy Aikman. Those are my three headed goats. And so, you know, always has been a Cowboys fan. Um, and never really thought I would get into sports media, even though I do have a journalism degree from the University of Pori State, the same school that Leon Lett went to. Right. Um, but I never thought I would be in this situation. Then what really happened was the pandemic kind of slowed things down for me. We had nowhere to go or nothing to do. Couldn't even go to games, really. And my brother Skywalker still one day reached out to him. was like, hey, man, just jump on my show. And I was like, OK, like, what is that? You know, what is that? Like a show, you know. So <laughs> I went out there, man, sat in my, my man cave on my old college laptop. And, man, we talked football for hours. Like, it was almost like a two and a half hour show. And after everybody in the comments was like, where's this channel? Where's this channel? Where do I find him? I was like. Give me a few days and <laughs> give me a few days. Um, so I started my YouTube channel, man. One of my very first videos was me predicting that the Dallas Cowboys should draft CeeDee Lamb. And then it's just been up ever since, man. So I'm truly blessed and humbled to be a voice in Cowboys Nation. I truly enjoy it. It's my passion. So like you, I born and raised a Cowboys fan. I had the good fortune of my late uncle, Willie Towns, played for the Cowboys, played for Tom Landry, he was a starter in the ice bowl, had a sack of Bart star. Like, so the Cowboys have been in my blood, much like yourself for ever since I can remember. And just the energy that comes with covering this team. It's interesting that, you know, as you have been in this space now, what has, what have you found about this space, whether it be positively or negatively, especially covering this team that gets you up every day and says, look, no matter what this team does, you know, whether they're winning games, losing games, making moves, not making moves, that gets you excited about covering this team every day. It's the fan base for me personally. Like Cowboys Nation is my my fuel that I always say now, right or wrong, because you know, trust me, <laughs> they're a lot to deal with. Yeah. Um, but it's really the people. And you know, when I kind of built my brand, I wanted to kind of take it where I merge the fandom with the actual journalism. And that's where I kind of, people kind of see that my brand is, is that, you know, Cowboys fans, they see me at every game. I'm at the tailgates. I'm, I'm just like them, but also I can cover the team in depth. I can break down film. I got sources and, you know, do draft video, different things like that. So we're really fused together because when I was on the other side of the fence, I used to be just like everyone else. I'll be talking on Twitter. You know, I even had the receipts of me talking about we should draft Dak Prescott. Like nobody cared back then. You know, <laughs> I always just felt like for me as a Dallas Cowboys fan, like who was really speaking for me? You know, like my voice wasn't getting heard. So then when I started to kind of grow my platform, I wanted to ensure that I wasn't that guy. And even though it's grown to the levels that we're at right now, that's why people see me still on Twitter, even though, you know, a lot of my people on my team, like get off of it. Right. But the Cowboys, like I interact with a lot of fans on Facebook and Twitter, and I'm still in, I'm still in Reddit groups and, you know, it's different things like that, because I really want to be enriched um, with the fan base. So I would say, you know, for me, Cowboys Nation, they get me up and going every day, even when I don't want to. I know there's a Cowboys fan out there really dependent on me for some type of insight, whether it's a draft or with this team. 
yeah, the I always say that this fan base is extremely diverse and it's obviously worldwide as well. The popularity of this team has allowed the fan base to grow as big as it has. And no matter what part of the country that you're in or part of the world, really, nowadays, you will find a Cowboys fan somewhere that feels some type of way about this team positively or negatively. And yeah. you watching this team over the last now three seasons, having won 36 games, 12 and five each of the last, you know, three seasons. And now watching this team this offseason so far, really not do much of anything. I don't know about you, but this is the most frustrated, probably the most angry, the most disillusioned I've seen this fan base maybe ever just because of the amount of success that they've had, but nothing really to show for in the playoffs from the way that you have covered and talked about this team, whether it be on your platform or with others, are you getting that some of the same similar sense based on how Cowboys fans are feeling about this team right now? Oh yes. It's disheartening because you know, when it comes to our fan base, we all have that kind of cluster of our fans that no matter what, why it's we don't boys, you know, DC for real, <laughs> we don't care about anything. We're still going to win. But when I see those folks even saying, ah, oh, man, I'm not feeling it right now. I think, you know, the, the entire fan base is down. And I said this on Twitter the other day. It's like, if you think about when we walked out of that AT&T stadium at that embarrassing loss from Green Bay, what has the Cowboys shown? to really show no no that was not acceptable i mean honestly like dan quinn didn't get fired if dan quinn wanted to be back in dallas he would have returned probably joe whitby would have returned like a lot of people would have returned so everything would remain the same you know there was no sense of urgency of getting the dak prescott deal done cd lamb deal done nothing moving forward with micah parsons you didn't go out and even pick up the phone to call Derrick Henry, like not just get there, like you didn't even inquire, you know, like you didn't even call to Derrick Henry. So there's no sense of urgency in free agency. So for a Cowboys fan, we're all kind of sitting back thinking, what's the plan? And I know we kind of pinned the all in thing on Jerry when that wasn't really what he said, because if you listen to the interview, he said, by the end of this year, we have, we'll be going all in. Like, bro, like it is what it is, but it's just like, for me, it's frustrating just like for a lot of Cowboys fans. And what was really the tip of the iceberg for me, Kev, was the coach Zimmer hire. Now, I think that coach Zimmer mm -hmm. is a decent hire, but when Dan Quinn was out there moonlighting and interviewing, why was we sitting on our hands and not interviewing other talented defensive coordinators around the NFL as well? And maybe there would have been a situation where we would have found a guy and be like, you know what, Dan, we appreciate you, but we got someone who's younger that matches the philosophy that we're trying to go with. We're going to move forward. But they kind of sat back on their hands. Dan Quinn was still at the Shrine Bowl wearing Cowboy stuff, and then he just dipped to Washington, and then we started grasping for straws. Who can we get now? And you have the conversations about Rex Ryan. I was sitting at the Super Bowl and people are like, you know, the Cowboys might get right. Like, we better not. <laughs> we better not go Rex Ryan. I'm like, listen, man, I'll be done. So I felt like Zimmer was the best of what's left. But was he really the best of the talent pool that was out there from a defensive standpoint? So that was kind of the tip of the iceberg. And then you have everything where we currently stand here in March. It's just been a lackluster offseason. It felt like the Zimmer hire was a comfort hire. He right. knows them. They know him, and the way things look right now, I mean, you've got a head coach in the final year of a five-year contract. Most of these guys, as we've come to learn, Michael Gelkin, the Dallas Morning News reporting that, you know, a lot of these guys are on one-year deals. Mm -hmm. So it feels like, look, either y'all put up or shut up or get out because <laughs> based on the way that things have gone the last three years, y'all may not be around to see this through anyway, which – I think for a lot of Cowboys fans, having watched this team now each of the last three years, and look, for better or for worse, the quarterback is the most important position, in my opinion, in all of team sports. And there's no more visible quarterback in the NFL outside of being the best one, Patrick Mahomes, in the league mm -hmm. than being the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And I have just been blown away, even with how poorly the quarterback, Dak Prescott, played against Green Bay my man finished top two in MVP voting. If you let that man walk virtually for nothing after this upcoming season, my contention has always been, do you believe in Jerry and Steven Jones to find a suitable replacement for Dak Prescott? Because I would answer that question and say no. And evidence has shown between the years of Troy Aikman and Tony Romo, they didn't know how to do it either. And they fell into Tony Romo as an undrafted player. And mm -hmm. then they found Dak Prescott eventually as a 
you know, a fourth round compensatory pick. Mm -hmm. Where are you with the quarterback at this point based on what they have and haven't done and what may be on the horizon for this team? For me personally, I want to extend Dak Prescott today. Like why, why keep dragging this thing out? We <laughs> need Dak Prescott. He, he gives us the best opportunity to win. And I keep trying to explain this to Cowboys fans. Like, listen, as you know, boring and lethargic as our offseason has been, the one guy that can give us some opportunity and glimmer of hope is, is number four. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the one yeah. thing that we got working for us, which a cowboy, a lot of Cowboys fans are out on. So I understand last year was frustrating because I felt like last year we saw the kind of turning of the tides when it comes to Dak Prescott, as you mentioned, right? Second runner up in MVP voting. I remember when we won the, the division, he was like, I'm not going to put on a hat because the job's not. So I kind of felt like, okay, now this is the Dak that we've been waiting for. And then we're all sitting out there versus Green Bay with egg on her face but me personally i think the cowboys have to get this deal done with dak because if you let him walk for nothing we are putting ourselves in a situation where it could be purgatory when it comes to the cowboys which i don't want to be because i know us older cowboys fans we've been through that a lot of the younger fans you might see on twitter and facebook they think it's all romo spins and deep, like <laughs> it wasn't like that you know what I'm saying like i remember no, Ryan Leaf and you know brad johnson's and you know the list goes on and on like it, it was bad cowboys nation and for a team that has shown no ability to replenish, like think about this, not just the quarterback position for a team that moved on from Amari Cooper and tried to replenish it with James Washington. Like that should let you know, like this isn't <laughs> their niche, you know? So it's no knock to trade Lance, but that's not Dak Prescott. Like it would be, it, it's going to be a full rebuild. If we move on from Dak and get zero value, it would be frustrating as a Cowboys fan. Cause like I was saying last night, even though the Cowboys are at odds with Dak with this comes to his contract, it's their fault. Y'all franchise tagged this man twice as a fourth round, you know, to, you know, pick like you could have easily got him for the Wentz price, the golf price, and maybe moved on. You drug your feet. You franchise tagged him twice. And so as the, the, the saying goes, yesterday's price is not today's price. Like Dak was an MVP runner up and he deserves his money and rightfully so. So if I had to gauge it, I think they get the deal done. I But just win. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can see us getting ready to gear up for Oxnard. I'm like, oh, you know, we got the deal. I'm like, what good is that do us now? You know, <laughs> like, you know, so we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, it's funny because the, the Cowboys, they, you know, were able to reduce his cap number by about four, four and a half million dollars, added on some more void years to which I've been trying to tell people, look, as much as the Cowboys could, if they wanted to, they could have pulled a lever and opened up. 20 some odd million dollars in cap space for Dak Prescott without having to ask him at all. Mm -hmm. The point that I'm making is the Cowboys have kicked so many cans down the road, whether it be Dak's contract, whether it was Tyron Smith before he left, obviously this off season, Zach Martin, Michael Gallup, Demarcus Lawrence, any number of players that you want to name, they've been kicking the can down the road for years. And guess what? It's kicking the ass back now because right. all this position that they're in, I keep telling people that, look, as much as y'all think the Cowboys should be spending money, their salary cap broke. Mm -hmm. so at some point, you've got to pay the Piper. Even the Rams, after they won their Super Bowl, looked around like, well, I guess it's uh, time to blow this thing up because right. while that whole F them picks thing was you know, nice and cool and trendy, mm -hmm. they were still finding ways to replenish their team. But at the same time, they had to pay up at some point. Mm -hmm. The Cowboys may be looking at it like it's time for us to pay up now, even with the success that this team has had and quote unquote going all in the way that folks may be wanting them to this offseason. Yeah, exactly. And I always tell Cowboys fans, it's like, you know, you're getting call from your cell phone provider. Like, man, I ain't, got, I ain't got it this month, man, but in six <laughs> months, man, I got you. You know what I'm saying? They call back in six months. I'm, I'm a little short. Can you get on? They always just trying to get this extension on paying these deals. And eventually it's like, no, we want our money. So yeah, I mean, I understand the all in approach, but think about what the Rams did, right? They went all in, won a Super Bowl, which we would definitely you know, wouldn't be upset about blew it up, but then rebuild it that quick, you know, because mm -hmm. they have some of these eyes and talents to, to replenish to the point where I know for me personally, the Rams was a team I didn't want to face in the playoffs because they were playing scary, you know, going at the end of the season. So, you know, it can happen, but the Cowboys for some reason believe that their way is the way you know i'm not sure who told them this i'm not sure what book they read or where they're getting the feedback from but they believe that this is the way to win championships ain't it in 30 years damn near but they believe that this is the philosophy to go with when they didn't even build the championship teams that they did 
with this philosophy. You know, you were aggressive. You had the Herschel Walker trade. You went and got Dion and Charles. Like you were taking risk after risk after risk. Even when you had a core of Michael, Emmett, and Troy, you were still taking risk to put talent around that those players. Now it's just like, you know, we got we got you know six, seven all pros. They're good. You know what I'm saying? We'll just, <laughs> we'll just put some deaf guys behind them and let them work it all out, which isn't the case. It hasn't been working in Dallas, and it's frustrating. When you look across the league, and even with our division rivals, and think, man, y'all got Saquon, man, y'all got Huff. I mean, y'all trying to get Justin Simmons too. Like, you know, see, like, can we just get something? You know, yesterday I was just asking to resign Jonathan Hankins. They said, nope, can't do that either. And I'm just like, all right, bro, I'm just gonna shut up. You know, so, so now it's like concerning. Like, are we going to even be able to afford Gilmore? I mean, with the prices tags that we've been offering these players. I mean, Gilmore ain't gonna take no disrespectful offer. So, right. I, I don't. I really just don't know what the plan is for this Cowboys for this season. And I think that's where a lot of Cowboys fans are getting discouraged. Let's take a quick break here on the Gray Area Podcast, and let's hear from today's sponsor of our podcast and our video, and let's hear from Aura. Today's video is brought to you by Aura. Do a Google search on your name and email address to see how much information comes up about you. I was devastated by the amount of information that I could be seeing searching my name and profile. And I knew then I needed to be protected for not just myself, but also for my family. Data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all out there. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, and other sensitive information. Aura also does so much more to protect me and my family from online threats that I can't see. It's really easy to set up, so I don't have to download several different apps to get things like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more. I get everything at one affordable price. You may already have one of these tools already, but not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Aura is always on, doing the hard work to protect me and my family so I can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. I value my privacy and I value yours. You can go to Aura.com slash Kevin Gray to start your two-week free trial. Please see the link in the description. Back here on the Gray Area Podcast. Again, appreciate our sponsor of our today's podcast and our video and appreciate Aura. For that before we went to break we were talking about you know what the plan may be for this team tuck and looking at it and i think for me and for a lot of folks we're looking around like well, what the hell is the plan because <laughs> i feel like the way that i look at this team and i said it a while back like the cowboys are the yankees they're the lakers you know they're the, they have the family business you got jerry you got steven you've got these folks here who have own this team for as long as they have, much like the Steinbrenners have done with the Yankees, much like how the Bus family has done with the Lakers for all of these years. And there has never been a sense for me, and you talked about a little bit how the Cowboys want to do it their own way. Stephen Jones mentioning some of that, you know, the other day when him and his boy Kid Rock was out there hanging out, you know, promoting some <laughs> right. PBR event, but whatever. Um, and the idea being that, look, there is no one's getting fired here. Mm -hmm. Jerry's not going to fire himself. Steven, for damn sure, not going to fire himself because why would he do that? So there's no real sense of urgency. You talked about, you know, the Rams. We've talked about the Eagles and other teams where Howie Roseman runs the Eagles. Les Snead runs the thing for, you know, the Rams. Dudes' jobs are on the line. Even Jason Light, when he was able to get Tom Brady to come to Tampa, like mm -hmm. dudes' jobs were on the line. So there was a sense of urgency to try to make something happen. There's no sense of that here because no one's losing their job anytime soon when it comes to this team. How mm -hmm. does a team like this find a way when they want to do their own way to try to eventually crack through and win a Super Bowl that in that way? Yeah, it's difficult, you know, because what Kansas City does we hear with Brett Veach, right? You have an intermediary. And I said, this mm -hmm. is probably the biggest problem when it comes to the Cowboys and also with Dak Prescott, right? Dak and Todd France are dealing directly with Jerry and Steven. So it's like you're you're bumping heads. Like you need someone to probably be in between to be like, listen, Dak, I know you're frustrated. They over here tripping. But this is what we got. You know, like you, you sometimes you need that middleman. But if you're just dealing directly with the person who writes the check, you're pretty much drawing a line in the sand. So I think 
Could the Cowboys use a GM? Absolutely, but they're never going to have one. So it's, it's frustrating because I feel like the Cowboys are putting business and winning contract negotiations over what's transpiring on the football field. And I think like to win this Dak deal, because Dak won last time, like they are willing to blow this thing up. Like if you don't cave, <laughs> I'll blow it up. You know what I'm saying? Well, you want your left tackle? Okay, good. He's gone. Your big X wide receiver, Michael Gallup, he's gone. You're running back. I'll get rid of him too. Your center, like keep playing with me. I'll rip this whole thing up. And I feel like that's where the Cowboys are right now. And it's frustrating because us as Cowboys fans, we want the best team on the field. You know, being here in Kansas City, covering the Kansas City Chiefs, like I was happy for my hometown of everyone, you know, seeing the confetti drop after the Super Bowl. Like, man, that should be us. You know, like that needs, yeah. to, that needs to be us. And I want that so bad for Cowboys Nation. But if you look at it, and I said this earlier online, if winning the Super Bowl was out of 10, I feel like the Cowboys roster last year, just even minus Trayvon Diggs was out of seven. But right now, I feel like we're at a five or a 4.5. Like, so we got work to do just to get back to that seven. And then I want to build on top of that, which all the high market and high value free agents are really gone. So it's going to be up to Will McClay to find a lot of bargain bees to actually go out there and nail this draft. You can't have another draft class like last year. And you're really putting the Dallas Cowboys in a bad situation and backing your, your scouts and, you know, some of your coaches in the corner to go out there and have a good quality team that can compete. Dak Prescott, CeeDee Lamb, Jake Ferguson, Michael Gallup, we're going to have a team. We're always going to have a team. You know, it's seven mm-hmm. wins. You know, we're never going to be a three-win team fully healthy, but that's not what we want. I want a championship, you know? And even if you say, okay, we split with Philly last year, I mean, Saquon is, is, is Saquon. You know, th- those little <laughs> things help get over the hump where – Philadelphia doesn't have to play their A game every game. It might be a game where Jalen Hurts is struggling or a stretch where Jalen Hurts is struggling, but then that's when Saquon really comes in, just like with the San Francisco 49ers, right? You can have a Brock Purdy because you can lean on Christian McCaffrey to get you up out of there. No slight to Rico. I think he's a good player, but if things are hitting the fan, we can't give Rico the ball 30 carries and get up out of there to win versus the San Francisco 49ers or Detroit Lions. So I think that's the biggest frustration when it comes to this Cowboys front office. Yeah, and you're asking Will McClay to be a magician once right. again. And look, people will point to the 2016, you know, NFL draft when they got Zeke and when they were able to get Dak Prescott. They look at the 2020 draft when they were say, say, somehow able to find a way to get a guy like, you know, CeeDee Lamb, Micah Parsons, you know, mm-hmm. they, like they've been able to find players here and there over the last few years that have really been able to be kind of the cornerstones of the franchise going forward. But at the same time, you're putting a lot of pressure on McClay, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, to not only replenish what you lost because you lost a ton, even if you don't feel like some of those parts were going to be the kind of contributors going down long term to be able to help you win a Super Bowl. Like you still lost, you know, the biggest example of this, which is funny. And I know Tyler Biotish isn't like, you know, you're all pro, all world center. But he has been a pretty damn good football player, right. you know, that the Cowboys have been able to draft and develop. And for the third year in a row, whether it was Connor Williams and now this year, Tyler Biotish, mm-hmm. you draft a guy, then you let him walk in mm-hmm. free agency. Like to, the idea of just continuing to churn this out over and over again at some point, I think will eventually catch up. And even in this draft, you got picks in the first, second, and third round, but you don't have a fourth round pick mm-hmm. in this year's NFL draft. They've got a ton of work to do just to try to get back to a point where you can feel confident that they could be competing at the top of the NFC East this upcoming season. Yeah, and that's one of my main concerns when it comes to this draft. They don't have the volume of picks that they normally have as well. Mm-hmm. You know, because even when you're just playing around having mock drafts, like, man, it gets kind of shallow after <laughs> you lose that fourth <laughs> round pick. So, you know, now the conversation is going to be like, should they consider a team trade back? But then sometimes you're kind of playing with your food because the board can fall a different way and the players that you think you can trade back and get get sniped. So, you know, like you said, it's it's going to be difficult for Will McClay to really fill this void, but to try to fill this void with rookies in the NFL draft, it's you, it sh- you shouldn't back your, your 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 team into that corner. So especially you know, if you're going to leave Tyler Smith there at left guard and have to maybe put a rookie left tackle out there, is it because if I'm Dak Prescott, I'm like, hey man, I don't want to be out here getting protected by a rookie left tackle right. when y'all could have had Tyler Smith for six and a half million dollars, even with the incentives, you could have right. had my you know great left tackle out here because you found a practice plan that worked for him. 
Mm-hmm. I wanted him instead of having a, maybe a rookie to deal with out here. Exactly. You could have Tyron for six million, have Tyler at left guard. And then if you go hit in a draft and you get a left tackle, okay, perfectly fine. And if Tyler, you know, or Tyron goes down, well, then you have a guy that you can plug in. But now it's like, we need to find a guy that we can plug in. And I think the Cowboys philosophy is what comes to Tyler Smith, he's either going to be a left guard or a left tackle, depending on how the draft falls. If they get like a Jordan Morgan or a Troy Fatano, okay, well then they'll probably keep Tyler Smith in left guard. But if they wipe out and miss, then it's like, okay, we're going to put you. So it's like, it's those types of games. Like you don't have a for sure answer. And it's a bad situation to put your quarterback in Dak Prescott. If you really care about him, (laughs) <laughs> with a brand new fresh center and a huge question mark at left tackle. Um, so yeah, man, and, and no running back. So it's <laughs> just like right, and no running back. Yeah, and no, no running, and no back, running back. So, yeah, there we go. So it's funny because I think when I look at the Tyler Smith situation, particularly for him, do I want to move him to left tackle and then have new center and left guard when I do have an all-pro left guard there? And do I want to have somebody having to play to protect Dak Prescott's blind side while the interior of my offensive line would be essentially two new guys. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm necessarily in the camp of wanting to do that. And maybe that might be some of the reason why you may consider leaving Tyler Smith there at left guard. At least you're not filling out two new positions right. on the left side where that is obviously crucial for the quarterback in this case. Yeah. Because honestly, I know the the idea is that you kick Tyler Smith out the left tackle and you plug TJ Bass at left guard, which I like mm-hmm. TJ Bass when I you know I like loved him when he came out of Oregon as a U- UDFA. But man, you're you're leaning on a UDFA to really take that leap to be a full time starter. And sometimes it's kind of cool to kind of be a deaf piece and kind of you know get in two or three games. <laughs> but when the spotlight is on you to play a full you know seventeen game season, including playoffs, it might be a little too much for you. So. Like I said, going in question marks at center with Hoffman, you know, left guard, left tackle. It's just a bad predicament for the Cowboys to be in. And you're seeing guys, you know, some of these older left tackles like, OK, this is a good quality name. And it's like, nope, Cincinnati. Nope. And it's like, <laughs> all mm-hmm. right, man. so I think I think they messed up with Tyron. Um, you know, I think that what really happened is they wanted to offer him the same deal as last year. But Tyron's like, no, I mean, I played at a high level and play a lot more games. You need to put a little extra in the bag. And the Cowboys say we can't do that for you. And then, you know, he ultimately came a New York Jet. So we shall That's see. It's so weird to say. That's still so weird. Yeah, to say. yeah. I always thought Tyron, Zach Martin will be the guys we'll never see in another uniform. You know, like this is it just doesn't seem right. You know, like it's it's mm-hmm. weird seeing him even like on Instagram and stuff like Jets. Like, bro, like it's Tyron <laughs> Smith. You know, you you've been here for so many years, and now you know, it's just like it's it's just crazy. You know, it's just, it's just crazy. And the crazy part is he's coming off one of his best seasons as of late. You know, now we let him go. You know, so we kind of found the formula of resting him in practice. All right, so let's yes. with that. Let's, you know, but, you know, you know. <laughs> look, it's it's the Cowboys. And look, you're right, and that was the part that bothered me. It was like y'all. It's partly y'all's fault that Tyron played as well as he did because y'all found the practice plan for him mm-hmm. to be able to rest during the week, and you got the most out of him since 2015, and he played literally at an All Pro level, and the Jets were like. Oh, you cool with taking this six and a half million? Right. Cool. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and if things hit the fan, then we don't owe you anything. Like, it was a no brainer. I know Kansas City, they they won. Like, everybody was like, how do we get Tyron Smith? And I was like, man, he, if you rest him and don't let him practice, can put him on that Brett Farr treatment plan. He's 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 perfect because on game day, he's going to show up. I mean, we even went through that versus the Cardinals when he was fully dressed, you know, on the sideline. And we were just like, no, we're going to rest him. Like, we saw the difference that he makes out there. So, you know, Cowboys are playing with their food right now. And hopefully there's a plan, man. But when you kind of look at what's available, I'm just like, nope, no, you know, I don't know. Mm, no. Nah. Right. You know, keep like, checking off the list. Yeah, it's like, no, like, not that know, guy, like the, the not that guy, get, not that guy. Yeah, yeah like, okay, that, that, that list is getting chopped up. So maybe they're waiting, doing the Cowboys thing, waiting for some players to be released. And I'm just like, why do we always have to buy off of someone else's, you know, I don't want to say trash bin, but off, you know, the sitting outside the street, like just go get what you mm-hmm. need. And I think that's the frustrating part. Even if you go back to the season prior to last year, we knew that we needed a wide receiver. We were taking OBJ to Mavericks games and doing all sorts of things. Granted, yes, you won the what deal. For that me. was. Yeah, what, what, oh, oh, man, man. What, what a time to be alive, man. But it's like we knew we could have used Brandon Cooks that year. We could have used them. 
just give up the picks, man. Just give up the picks and let him help us that year. But no, they waited, got Brandon Cooks this season after. Okay, well, cool. But it's just like we needed to fill that void. And I think that's the frustrating part when it comes to the Cowboys is like they're never proactive. They're always reactive. Like, I don't care that Shaq Leonard maybe won a little more. We needed linebackers. We, it was evident. We all knew that we needed linebackers. Listen, I'm not letting you talk to Philly. How much to get this deal done? Like, I'm not letting you walk out this luncheon. But they didn't do it. And then we all sat back and say, what happened to this in the playoffs? Well, Aaron Jones ran him down your throat because you didn't have any linebackers like we all knew. So that's the frustrating part. So this year, they'll load up at linebacker. It was like, well, we needed that last year, man. Like, we needed that last year. It's just the, it's just the, the Cowboys way, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And look, Tuck, I'm trying to turn over a new leaf as I get older in this life, and I'm trying not to do recreational anger as much <laughs> as I used to, whether it be the NCAA tournament or the Cowboys. It's kind of I've gotten myself to a point of resolve. It's like this is just who they are and what they're going to be, and they think they're going to find their way to a Super Bowl championship, mm -hmm. which hasn't worked for them for almost damn near three decades. Right. So all the negativity that has been around this fan base, and justifiably so because of what the Cowboys – have not been able to do from a playoff success standpoint, find me some positivity for this team. As much as they have not been able to satisfy the fan base in terms of getting some guys in free agency, whether you feel about the salary cap situation or not, where is the positivity for this team, even with a first place schedule and the amount of playoff teams that they're going to be playing? I believe it's like seven or eight playoff teams mm -hmm. they're going to be playing next season. Where's the positivity for this Cowboys team going into this offseason? Well, I think my biggest positivity, which I've been kind of preaching, is our boys are going to have to become men. So it's like Micah Parsons is no longer just a young defensive. Like he has to become that guy and that voice in the locker room. Same with Trayvon Diggs, same with CD Lamb. Because I feel like when you watch CD or you watch a Trayvon, they kind of just set back. You know, defensively, they let J Ron kind of lead and some of those other guys. Like, no, this needs to be your team. And they need to really take a huge leap forward. Jake Ferguson has to take a huge leap forward. So I think that's one of the silver linings. We can kind of get some positivity. Dak Prescott, for me, like I said, as long as Dak is out there, I at least got a chance. I, I at least got a chance with Dak. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe, huge maybe. Don't quote me on this, y'all. <laughs> but maybe kind of seeing how things are just from the players' perspective, you know, they follow us on Twitter and everything. Mm -hmm. Maybe this kind of bands them together. Maybe they bond behind Mike McCarthy being on this one-year deal. And, you know, that Mike McCarthy kind of rallies against the front office, and they really band together as brothers and make things happen, you know. But it's a huge if. You know, I'm, I'm just I'm just spitballing things out there. Because to be honest with you, Kev, it's not much to really be excited about. Like you mentioned, the first-place schedule is brutal. Even the schedule at home is brutal. You know, mm -hmm. it's just it's just a lot of things. I mean, even if you're tossing just from a statistical standpoint, right? When's the last time a team has won back to back division champs in the NFC East? So that's already a mark against us right there because the Philadelphia Eagles just handed us to it randomly last year. We kind of just caught it. So, I mean, with all these different strikes going against us, it's really hard. And I'm going to say my last glimmer of hope. It's just that we knocked this draft out the park where we're sitting back saying, oh, my God, we killed it. And that's a big if. That's all I got for y'all, Cowboys. That's, that's, about it. that's about it, man. That's about it. So that's all I got right now. I mean, I like the idea of these guys having to look themselves in the mirror and banding together as a group and as a locker room saying, look, the amount of negativity based off of what we didn't do in the playoffs, the way that people are feeling about us, talking about us, because let's not be naive here. They see it. They hear it. It's about whether how much they decide to let in or not that they decide to move on with. But at the same time, Dak Prescott, CeeDee Lamb, Micah Parsons, Trayvon Diggs, who we know is extremely vocal, especially when we get to training camp because he's going to be yapping and chirping, you mm -hmm. know, doing his thing and what he does. How do they grow up and do they figure it out? Because as much as Dak Prescott is still very much a young man as far as this life is concerned, he's an old man and the veteran now in the locker mm -hmm. room. Like, he's the old head in the group you know, that's got to continue. Like We're talking about Dak Prescott going in the year number nine for mm -hmm. him this upcoming season. Crazy. This <laughs> It's wild to think that that cat just several years ago, and it's funny, I'm going to go off on a quick tangent. How differently would we look at Dak Prescott if he were able to take the Cowboys to the NFC Championship game 
his rookie year. Because I think people really forget that as a rookie, my man would toe-to-toe with yeah. Aaron Rodgers, especially in that second half. And if it hadn't been for, you know, one of them goofy, amazing passes that Aaron Rodgers likes to throw, finding Jared Cook on the sideline, we may be talking about Dak Prescott having taken the Cowboys to an NFC Championship game in his rookie year. Mm-hmm. Like, I just wonder how much differently we would look at him as a player and as a guy that leads his franchise if he had taken the Cowboys to that NFC Championship game in, back in 2016. I think for the most part, he we, he would have been looked at differently because what happens is he still has that Romo stigma because a lot of people say, man, if Romo, though, would have played that game, we would have beat Green Bay. I'm like, Dak Prescott. Which I was well. one of them. I'm not going to lie to you. I was one of the guys that when Romo got healthy, I was like, all right, this is Romo's team. It's built for him. Get him back in there. But Dak and them dudes just – Kept winning. They were rolling. They were rolling. And, I, and I feel like it was a game of double dutch. Like Romo kept waiting for his chance to get in. And young Dak and Zeke were just carving things up. And, you know, salute to my guy, Des. He said the story was it was actually Romo's right hand man and Jason Witten that went in the locker room was like, yo, it's Dak's team. You know, like, you know, so, so I think like it, it, it would have caused a split in the locker room, right? Because it's like, okay, you have this young kid. He's been balling ever since the moment he stepped on the field. We are rolling right now. And now you want to go back to Tony doing things the Tony way. It would have probably changed the dynamics. So, you know, I get it. But I think, yeah, if you went to an NFC championship his rookie year, he'd probably been looked at slightly different. But my frustration with that is like, just because it's the Cowboys, we put this huge NFC championship appearance on a mantle. I'm like, at the mm-hmm. end of the day, all that means is that Cowboys fans spent more money for tickets to have more of a heartbreaking loss. Like, I'm trying to get to the Super Bowl, like yeah. just getting to an NFC championship game and and the same thing that happened, you know, versus Green Bay happens to us. I'm still frustrated. I'm actually more <laughs> frustrated because I spent more money going to that game. So, you know, I get it. But, like, it's just one of those low-hanging fruits. Like, well, Dak can't even get to an NFC championship game. Like, I don't care about him getting there. I want him to win it and go to the Super Bowl and then win that too. So, but honestly, I think that Dak is the perfect quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, my goodness, Kev. Like, who else could deal with all this scrutiny? Like, I'm, I don't even play for the team, and I'm tired with all the scrutiny that Dak goes through as a quarterback. <laughs> you know, so it's like I can imagine what he has to sit back and take on a day to day basis, and you know, the slander from the fans, and sometimes the media, and you know, ESPN is like just nonstop. Like, he is the perfect person to really take all that on his shoulders and just keep on thriving and keep on thriving. So we'll see what happens this upcoming season, but I hope it's not his last season in Dallas. Yeah, and for those who watch and listen to this, and this is not to put aside, you know, the current, you know, situation that he's facing with in terms of, you know, the extortion claim that he's made against a woman who's claiming sex that he's that she was sexually assaulted by him. Like, I'm not putting that aside at all and dismissing any of that, because obviously that's to be taken seriously from a football standpoint. Mm -hmm. I mean, the quarterback around here has gone through a lot and even in his own personal life has gone through a lot and still had found himself playing the best football of his career, you Mm -hmm. know, this past season. And I just wonder, as I look at this team going forward, you talked about, you know, the, you know, the picks that they have, the amount of work that they've got to do just to get back to a certain point where we feel confident they can even get a chance to make a run toward a Super Bowl. I wonder, and I've been trying to figure out, we talked about the plan a little bit earlier. Is this somewhat of a soft rebuild for this team? Because not just their salary cap situation, but, having to pay Micah, having to pay CD, having to pay Dak. And those three guys, when it's all said and done, will be your top three salary cap hits. Are they preparing themselves to try and get younger and cheaper while knowing that the three guys that are their three best players are going to be making a majority of the money on this cap and they got to figure out a way to thread that needle, even with trying to remain successful and trying to make a run at this thing? Yeah, I a thousand percent agree. This is a... I think it's more of a full rebuild, honestly. I think they're plotting, right? I think what they're going to go out there, like I mentioned, kind of go out there with the team, and if things hit the fan, they're going to try to tear it up and maybe get a younger quarterback because this is where I kind of pivoted with the whole Trey Lance thing. Originally, I was excited on, like, we got Trey Lance. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good value for a fourth-round pick. Like, we're going to move on from Cooper Rush and, you know, have a good quality (laughs) backup in case something happens to Dak. And then it was like, ah, not so fast, my friend. Then Stephen Jones spoke about it. He was talking about Trey Lance and his contract and the flexibility. I'm just like, oh, man, here we go. So I think that's the case. But like you mentioned, got to pay Dak possibly, CeeDee Lamb, Micah, uh, Micah Parsons, but also Deron Bland. You know, so, you know, so it's like the list goes on and on with some of these players when they perform in the way that they do. And I think from the Cowboys standpoint, it's like, 
from them hitting on the draft on these prospects, they're like, okay, how do we kind of get out of this financial mess? And what they're going to do is they're going to kind of roll a team out there, maybe keep Dak on this one-year prove-it deal, Mike McCarthy on this one-year prove-it deal. And if it hits the fan, they'll probably move on from Dak, bring in Trey Lance at a much cheaper rate, sign CD, sign Micah, and try to build off a younger quarterback. And if that fails, then you might have another bridge quarterback under Trey Lance. So it's going to be a bumpy ride for Cowboys Nation. But like I said, the one thing I will say is this, Kev, is that Dak always comes to push back when his back's against the wall. You know, because even last year, I felt like that Trey Lance thing, let's keep it a book, that was a slap to the face. You know, and he was like, okay, this is what we're doing right now. And so he kind of went Aaron Rodgers in mode where he almost, well, he should have really won the MVP, but we lost a few games. But like he kind of thrives on that. Like going back to the 2020 season, even though he had the injury, like Dak was on a mission that year when he was franchise tagged twice. So maybe this, if they put him in a situation where it's like a last year, you know, last dance season, he'll have his back to the wall again to prove everybody wrong. But it's just, it's just an unfortunate situation to be in because I just don't think it's good for football. Uh, you know, a bunch of players on one-year deals, coaching staff on one-year deals. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't read con Super Bowl contention to me, to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, like it, it is, you know, like we're all in, you know, because I'm like, even from a standpoint of Mike Zimmer, it's like, are we going to let Mike Zimmer fully decorate or he's going to have to decorate with some of the things that we already have in house, you know? So that's the, that's the question mark. And, the way we handled the offseason thus far, it's like you have to just dress them. <laughs> you better fix up these Dan Quinn guys and make it work. So, you know, we shall see, but it's going to be a tricky season. Maybe I've been looking at this whole all in thing the wrong way. Maybe it's all in on a rebuild versus all in on trying to right, win. Yeah, yeah. A Super Bowl it, championship. That's the thing, maybe man. Jerry meant to say what he did say. Maybe we just didn't take it the right way right. when he said it the first time. Yeah, all in. Yeah, I mean, all in on the rebuild. So, and, and that's what we really need, right? We need, you know, when Stephen Jones is out there with Kid Rock and all this, like, actually, no, nah, we need to sit down and have a real press, press conference because there's some questions we need to ask y'all right now. You know, they, they kind of escaping scot free right now, traveling the world and all sorts of stuff. And, going to South by Southwest, like, nah, we need you back in, you know, Frisco sitting in front of the, the press because we got to ask y'all a few things to really clarify because right now it don't, it don't feel like all in for me. I mean, salute to blogging for the boys. Uh, they put out the graphic, right? We got Eric Kendricks and we had like <laughs> nine or 12 players who, who's walked. I'm like, you got one, we got one outside free agent, one. And that was because Zimmer had to pick up his cell phone and possibly hit his cash app and say, you know what? Don't join San Fran. I, I need you. I need you. You know, because so, if I'm Zimmer, I'm like, damn, man, y'all trying to hang me out the dry? Like, like, what is this? Like, you got Micah. Make it work. You got Trayvon yeah, coming yeah, back. Yeah. Make it work. Yeah, what they say on Friday, hey, make it enough. You know, Smokey's mom was like, that ain't enough. Make it enough. You know? <laughs> like, right. All right. So, exactly. Because you know, it's funny how Dan Quinn ain't probably got his full physical address, but he went and got Bobby Wagner just like that. We've been asking for Bobby man, Wagner listen. the last three years, and Dan Quinn's like, oh, Got him just just like that, you know. No, no pushback, no nothing. So yeah. I've been screaming to the rooftop the last two years. Hey man, go get that dude that used to play with that dude in Seattle because he probably wants him because he knows what he's doing at linebacker. Because oh, that's right. You need linebacker help. And what does right. Bobby Wagner do the last two years? Had an all pro season in mm -hmm. Los Angeles, and then last year has a career high, what 183 tackles in seattle and folks mm -hmm. talking about he washed and this that and the other hey man he still got apparently got mm -hmm. plenty enough in the tank and look the first chance he get to go play with dan quinn somewhere else what does he do he goes gets to play with dan I quinn I don't, in, think in he even, I don't even think he even spoke to other teams i think he went directly to washington just that easy just that easy you know and it's just like man so a lot of people don't want to see it but there is a huge problem with the front office and the way they go about things. And I'm like, Dan Quinn is actually just carving things up in free agency with Eckler and Chen. And, you know, they're probably not done and you're plucking away our talent. So I'm just like, why can't we do the same? I think that's the question. Like we see it so many different teams. We even see the saints who was kind of strapped in, in cap Hill. They're even still making like, why can't we like, what's the real situation? And all they're going to do is say Dax fault. <laughs> It's his fault. <laughs> like, only so much pie to go around. Almost, almost so much pie. pie. I'm sick of the pie, man. I want the cake. <laughs> <man>. like, <laughs> so. Last thing before we get out of here, obviously it's draft season. You're in the middle of getting prepared for this year's NFL draft, obviously from a Cowboys perspective as well. Give me a name or two or maybe three that you look at and you say, okay, if the Cowboys can find a way to get this guy and this guy, maybe they can salvage some things as far as getting some rookie talent that can really help them 
right now? Who are some of those guys that you've been looking at that you feel like could be realistically there, especially at 24 and 56 in the first and second round? Yeah, it's forever changing now because now we got so many holes than we originally had. But, you know, a guy that I definitely have circled in, looks like the Cowboys had a, a private workout with him is Jordan Morgan, left tackle out of the University of Arizona. Um, phenomenal left tackle slash guard flexibility. He reminds me a lot of Rashawn Slater, who we drafted in the Micah Parsons draft, um, but kind of has that flexibility, like a guy who's going to be out of the box ready. Um, great in pass pro, but has you know some strength and leverage to put alongside Tyler Smith. So I think Jordan Morgan would be one of those guys where it's kind of like the Tyler Smith situation where you feel like, would you draft them at 24? Possibly not, but you're dang sure not going to get them at 56. And I feel like with this year's draft class, there's not a quote unquote, a lot of pure left tackles. There's like a few left tackles and a lot of right guys who've never played right tackle who can possibly work as a project and convert. But Jordan Morgan is a pure left tackle. So I would keep an eye on Jordan Morgan. Um, also, linebacker, a guy who I had pencil was Edrin Cooper, linebacker out of Texas AM. But to be honest with y'all, he's flying up the boards, man. Like, you know, he's flying up the boards. So will he be there at 56? Possibly not. Um, but the Cowboys did take a flight on him. He's box office. You know, he's he's high motor. One of those guys that Zim would definitely love can play on the line of scrimmage. So um, Edwin Cooper. Um, and then running back. Running back is the most unique uh, position of this year's class because you have a few guys. It's a cluster. Like last year. You had Gibbs and you also had Bijan. They're like the, the clear cut favorites. And then it's everybody mm -hmm. else. This year, it's flavors of ice cream, depending on who you talk to. So, you know, I know a lot of people talk about Jonathan Brooks out of Texas. He might be a lot of people's, you know, running back one, but he had an ACL tear in November. Will he even be ready for the first opening camp? Like, I not, I mean, it's 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 a stretch. So I think that opens up a lot of conversation where you could get a guy like uh, Trey Benson out of Florida State, or you have. I know you like, love your Florida State. Yeah, guys. I know, but they they, they, <laughs> they, they they pass they pass on my nose anyway. So I mean, I'm taking all those guys off. They don't they don't draft them. Uh, but yeah, Trey. Don't Benson, let Keon Coleman be sitting there though. Don't let Keon Coleman be sitting. That's there, another though. name, right? Keon Coleman, like this wide receivers, this wide receivers class is going to be there as well. Where it could be guys at 56. So you know, Trey Benson running back. Um, also, Jalen Wright out of the University of Tennessee. Because I feel like we really do need to go get a running back and. Where I've been preaching, not not side dishes. I want an entree, like a guy that I know is is ready. Like you know, you can get a guy in the seventh round, it's kind of be like a little entree running back. No, I want a guy where it's like, you know what? I can give him twenty five carries. He's gonna be perfectly fine. Um, so Jalen Wright, but yeah, you know, Keon Coleman can possibly be sitting there. Um, I highly doubt like Troy Franklin, wide receiver out of Oregon, is gonna past Kansas City just off the speed. But you're gonna have a lot of quality guys to really go and get. You just can't sit back and, and make those mistakes. You can't miss this draft. So I think the Cowboys, they should. They, they should be able to knock it out the park. But where I get concerned is the need conversation versus best player available. That makes sense. Like it's going to be, it's going to be, too, we have so many question marks. The conversation in the war room is going to be back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. Where somebody, whoever is that final voice and, with everybody being on one year deals, who's going to be that final voice? It might be Jerry and Steven, which hold on tight, Cowboys Nation. <laughs> you know, they, so they might be thinking, okay, well, if we get this guy, we can move out of this contract. I'm like, I'm not trying to draft for the future. I'm trying to draft for now, but I know how they think they're probably going to be trying to stash for the future. So we'll see. But there's a lot of good names out there at 24 and 56 um, that the Cowboys should be able to pluck away a lot of good out of the box talent. Regardless, they have got a ton of work to do this offseason. It's, you know, I've said that the other day, you know, it really truly is the end of an era. I mean, watching Tyron Smith walk out the door, Leighton Van Der Esch, you know, announcing his retirement, you know, due to medical issues, Michael Gallup being cut, which I mean, we saw coming. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the amount of departures that we've seen from this team and still some that still may be happening it definitely it feels like the end of an era and the way that the Cowboys are going to, have to start some things over. I had tweeted out a picture I, watching Leighton Van Der Esch and Jalen Smith doing the uh, wolf howl together. I was like, you know what? At one point, we thought we had our cornerstone linebackers for a right. decade in those right. two, and now yeah. neither one of them <laughs> are with this team anymore mm -hmm. just six years after they've got here in terms of Leighton Van Der Esch and Jalen Smith. It just 
it just shows you the the, the life of an NFL player and how quickly things can change sure. mm-hmm. for a player and for a franchise as quick as it did, especially using the example of those two for the Cowboys. And that's why it's important for these players to go get your money. You know, Leighton Van yeah. is 28 years old, y'all, and he's retiring. So I know a lot of Cowboys fans or just NFL fans, like, you don't need to be greedy. You're with one bad play, because we saw what happened with Trent Williams, one bad play can change the course of your career. You want to make sure your future of yourself and your family is solidified. So, you know, me personally, I'm never against players trying to get their money. Now, sometimes they kind of go a little bit overboard, but still, it's it's what they work for. If they deserve it, they deserve it. And I think when it comes to CeeDee Lamb, Micah Parsons, and Dak Prescott, those are the three players I can't say you don't deserve it. Now, there are some players we sign. I'm just like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, but for the most part, yeah, for those three, I mean, they perform like the best at their position, so they're going to want to be paid like it. So we'll see. But the Cowboys has got to do something. Just do something. You know, I'm, 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 I'm out of options. After yesterday, man, after the whole Hankins situation, like, I don't know. You know, Bro, like, they couldn't find a bag of chips for Jonathan Hankins, boy. Yeah, they, Jonathan they couldn't. Hankins. You know, like, and here's the thing. It's like a lot of Cowboys fans, like, he didn't do anything. Well, I remember everyone was saying, wait till Hankins gets back and then the run defense will improve. Well, yeah, if you want to stop the run, you're going to need your big interior nose tackle. And you let what $500,000 be the difference between losing him. Like put a little extra in the bag, show the players that you appreciate them. And I think that goes a long way, but for some reason the Cowboys don't. So now we have a whole nother void to fill going to draft. So maybe the defensive tackle sitting there again at, at 24 and they'll pull the plug on that. But I don't know. They better hope Mozzie hit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, and that's the amount of pressure you're putting on last year's draft class. And I keep asking people, who are these prospects from last year's class? You think you should take this drastically? You know, Mozzie, I want to just take a step forward, but a mm-hmm. drastic leap to kind of fill that void and, you know, expecting Overshone, who I love, to come off of ACL and hit the ground running and be what we saw in preseason. Like, that's a tough ask for Deuce to come in and be the running back, too. You know, like, we're asking these young players. To Hell, really even play. Trayvon coming back from his torn ACL. Exactly. exactly. You know, Trayvon as well. You know, then you have what Junior Fioco and Awesome Richards, like, you're asking them to take a massive leap forward and eh, you know, that that's a tricky situation to be in. So we shall see Cowboys standing. But at the end of the day, we got each other, right? You know what I'm we, got, we got each other, man, you know? <laughs> so, you know, you know, that's all I can say about now, you know, me going to Cowboys games. That's right now. It's just to hang out with Cowboys nation and tailgate and have fun. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to this thing together. Talk, tell the folks where they can find you, what you got going on, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Once again, man, you can find me on all social media platforms at JTuck151. That's Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You know, salute the Cowboys TikTok, man. Um, find me on TikTok. My YouTube channel is CFO Sports listed below. So come on by. We do a lot of Dallas Cowboys football. But even if you're not a Cowboys fan, we do a lot of NFL draft content. We break down film sessions of a lot of prospects, a lot of prospects that you might not be familiar with. Just trying to educate the community because the small school guys, you know, they definitely add value and for the Cowboys standpoint, we kind of hit on undrafted free agency. So, yeah, stop on by CFO Sports. You can also hear me on KLKC Radio here in Kansas City, also 810 WHB with my guy Darren Smith on the ship. Next week, we will be out in Vegas covering the boxing event. Um, so, yeah, we're just just staying working, man, staying busy. So I just love talking sports. Like I said, Cowboys Nation, I appreciate each and every one of you guys. And, you know, thanks for support and giving me the platform that I currently have. Well, Tuck, you have done a fantastic job, continue to do a fantastic job covering not just the Cowboys, but the entirety of the NFL. Your your takes are hot, your opinions are strong, and you bring it every time, whether it be on social media or on your platform on YouTube. And I just appreciate watching you continue to grow in this space. And along with you, Skywalker Steel, Vods Lombardi, Foots, like I don't want to leave anybody out, Big Game James, like uh, every all the y'all fantastic at what you do and it just i love love having the chance to be able to collaborate with y'all when i have the opportunity to do so and uh this definitely will not be oh no let's do it again man we'll definitely do this for sure channel man so like i said we're gonna have a you know we're gonna have a dead off season (laughs) so we we might have to start talking you know kansas versus missouri or something man because the cowboys ain't giving us much to talk about so so yeah man thanks for having me and we'll definitely do it again for sure that is it for this episode of the Gray Area Podcast. Again, appreciate Jay Tuck for joining me here 
on the episode today for Interview Wednesdays. You, again, you can watch this on my YouTube channel at Kevin Gray Sports. Make sure you like and comment on the video. And if you're listening to it on the podcast, make sure you give it the podcast a five star rating and write a review for it and subscribe to the gray area wherever you get your podcast for free. I'll be back on Friday with my man Reg Atatula of 105 through the fan for Reg Fridays as we talk a little NCAA tournament, NBA playoff races heating up as well. We'll have a lot to talk about on Friday with Reg Atatula of 105 through the fan. Until then, my name is Kevin Gray, Mavericks pre and post game host on 97 One the Freak and host of the Gray Area Podcast. I'll talk to you on Friday. Peace.